thankfulness. I was reading from Sarah Young's book, um, and I wrote down some things that applied to me, and I'm going to share them with you, and I kind of wrote them in my own words. But uh, I want to say that these thoughts came from uh, Sarah Young. And uh, and I'm just going to read you some things. And we're going to be looking at thankfulness today in Psalm 118. But as we walk with our Father, Son, and Spirit along the high road of thanksgiving, we will find the delights that He has made for us. And I agree with that. Do you want to find the, del the delights that He's made for you? We must realize that we live in a fallen world where blessings and sorrows intermingle freely. We all have blessings. Sometimes we don't see them. And we all have sorrows. A constant focus on adversity defeats many Christians. A constant focus on adversity defeats many Christians. Does everybody have adversity? The answer would be yes, they do. Do you have adversity? Of course you do. But do we focus on it? And tragically, most of us do. They walk in brightness and see only the grayness of their thoughts. That's me. That's you. We walk in brightness all around us, but many times we only see the grayness of our thoughts. Do you know what I mean by grayness of our thoughts? Things look dull and hopeless, and in truth, they're not. Neglecting giving thanks can darken your mind. If you're caught up in looking at all the issues that are problems in your life and you forget to look for all the things to be thankful for, it'll darken your mind. And then finally, we can walk through the darkest days with joy in our hearts because we know that the light of his presence is still shining on them. Read it one more time. Now, these are put in my words, but it was kind of her thought, which became my thought. We can walk through the darkest days with joy in our hearts because we know that the light of his presence is still shining on them. I think of my brother Brimer, who is with the Lord now. He went through some hard times. But knowing Brimer like I do, and uh, Linda knows him much better than all of us, but knowing Brimer, he had his mind set on things that are above. My buddy Ross knew that's going through so much right now. Man, he just lifts me up talking to him. And uh, just things that he's going through. It could be you, it could be me, and it may be. Well, thankfulness. Some thoughts that I wrote down. As you let thankfulness rule in your heart, you, you thank him for blessings in your life. You see him. You look for him. And it's a marvelous thing that happens as we thank him for the blessings in our life. It is, it's as if the scales fall off our eyes, enabling us to see more and more of his glorious riches that are ours. As you thank God, for all the blessings that he's given you as you just go through life looking for things to thank him for. You're going you're gonna to begin to see things that you never saw before that you have to be thankful for. I mean, I, I look at Robinson and his family, the stuff they're going through now, and, uh, and then I get to thinking about, well, here they are. They, they live in a, a nice house. They have clean water to drink. He's had to buy water his whole life. But now he can go to the sink and turn on the water. Now he's got water filters on it too, but, but you can drink it right out of the tap. But the water filters makes it even better. Robinson's been a while since you had to buy water for your house, hasn't it? Yeah. And let me tell you what else they can do. They can flip a light switch and the lights come on. You say, well, of course, that's how it does. Not in Pakistan. You see, they have rolling blackouts his whole life. That's all he'd ever known is the power on. You can flip the light switch on. You can go to a doctor and he has a clue about what's going on. You don't have to go to the doctor and tell him what you think it is. <clears throat> it's just amazing. You don't have to buy only meat that you see prepared in front of you. 
because, you know, where he came from, uh, you didn't buy a lot of beef because you don't know what kind of bacteria or stuff. Am I right on that, Robinson? You know, you buy chickens because you can, you know, they were, a chicken was cackling this morning and he's, he's in the pot this afternoon. Things that you just don't even think of, that we take for granted here. He doesn't take those things for granted. And yes, he's gone through some stuff trying to get his driver's license and his social security card and his, and his work permit. Well, he has all those things now. And so when he was going through it for over two years, it looked like it would never come. Next thing is going to be the right job for him, in addition to what he's already doing with Grace Walk. He's still going to do those things. And, and the money that you're supporting him with, and many of you are, I'm really grateful for that. Don't stop. But uh, it's minuscule compared to what you know a family needs to live because it's just not that much. If you want to raise more, you can go to Grace Walk and you can go to Give and scroll down to his name and click on it and use your credit card and you can you can uh, give directly online to Robinson Sodic and I I would appreciate that. But he's just one. It's me too. It's you too. We all go through things, and it seems like the older we get, the more they are. But you know, the older we are, we should have developed a more of a thankful spirit. Because we can look back over our lives. Just think about it. Just take a moment and just look back over your life. And all the things that you're thankful for now that you missed when it happened. I can think of the car wrecks that I was in. One in particular where it rolled and flipped and went end over end down an embankment. And I didn't have my seatbelt on. Somebody hit me on a highway. It was raining. Spun my car around and it rolled end over end. And we crawled out. What was the windshield? It was gone. All the windows were broken out. The seats were laying flat because when we hit, we hit in back, you know, the back end first, and the wheels were still spinning, and it smushed the top down. Had we hit front, we would have been killed because neither one of us, me and another friend, neither one of us were believers at the time. It would have killed us both. And the impact, the seat bent back like this, but neither one of us was hurt seriously. Amazing. Not a drop of blood. God thing. At that point, we stood and looked at the car, and I said to my buddy, and he said to me, we agreed, God wants us alive for something. We didn't know what. That's just God. And there's so many other things, things that you can be thankful for. And listen to this. Things you can be thankful for that God did not give you that you thought you wanted. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't give me what I thought I wanted. You can be thankful for things that God allowed or caused or gave that we didn't think we wanted at the time. But he was gracious and he gave us what we needed rather than what we wanted. It could have been something that brought discipline to our lives. Could have been a humiliating thing at the time. And yet, God was in it. And we thank God for all things. Well, thankfulness, as it rules in our life, it changes everything. A life of praise and thankfulness becomes a life filled with miracles. As you go through life praising Him for everything, you begin to see miracles that were always there. You're not asking for miracles. You're beginning to see what He's already doing. You stop trying to be in control of your life and focus on what he is doing. The power of praise and focusing on what he is doing. This is how we were created to live. We were created to live a life of praise. And here's where I'm going with this. An evidence of trusting God is a thankful heart. Do you have a thankful heart? You know, thankful heart, that's not saying, Lord, I thank you for that money you gave me. Thank you for my car. Thank you for my family. It's not that. It's a thankful heart is, Lord, thank you, period. We live a life of constant thank yous. Well, why do we give thanks? I'm going to share some scripture, and then I'm going to share a few 
truths that the Lord showed me, and then we're going to be done. If you'll turn to Psalm 118, and I'm going to kind of roll through this, this whole chapter, 29 verses in this chapter, and I'm not going to read them all. But I'm just going to show you some things that Psalm 118, by the way, the psalmist, I think this was David who wrote this, and everybody's got things that you say, well, David, yeah, he was king. He had plenty of stuff to be thankful for. Really? You mean when Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him? You mean that time? David had all kinds of things he went through. And he failed miserably at times. And yet God referred to him as a man after God's own heart. Psalm 118.1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. If you don't see anything in your life that you think is worthy of giving thanks for, think about this. Give thanks to the Lord. And this word Lord is uh, the word Yahweh. When you see Lord and it's in all caps, that's the word Yahweh. It's I am that I am. That was the one that created. That was the one that met Bo Moses at the burning bush. That was the one that wrestled with Jacob. And that was the one in the New Testament that said, before Abraham was born, I am. Folks, we're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ right here. Some people say, well, that was the Father. Well, you see, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So in essence, yes, it was. Because every good thing that you think Jesus has and does and has and will do for you comes from the Father. So they're one, and yet they're separate. But they think exactly alike. So give thanks to Yahweh, I am that I am, for he is good. That is his nature. For his loving kindness is everlasting. In verse 2 it says, Oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Can you say that with me? Say it with me, even if you're listening. Say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Say it again. His loving kindness is everlasting. Verse 3, it says, Oh, let the house of Aaron say, His O loving kindness is everlasting. At the house of Aaron are the priest. And in verse 4, it says, oh, Let those who fear the Lord, Yahweh, say, His loving kindness is everlasting. In verse 5, For from my distress I call upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Verse 6 through 9, listen to this. If you don't know this, you might need to just meditate on this. Ready? The Lord is for me. Think about that. Do you see that? The Lord is constantly for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If the Lord is for you, what can man do to you? The Lord is for me among those who help me. You see, if there are people that are out to get you, the Lord is for you. If there are people that want to help you, the Lord is for you. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. Look with satisfaction. Now, here's what some of us think. Hey, listen, I've been there. <laughs> Believe me. And it seems like lately it's been a lot of the time. Somebody's out to get me, they better watch out. They don't know me. That's not what he's talking about. It's not they're going to get theirs. That's not it. You know what God's going to do for those that hate you? It sounds stupid what I'm going to say. That's exactly right. He's going to love them. Those that hate you, God loves. Boy, that doesn't sound right does that mean that we can't protect our families does not mean that does that mean there's not consequence for things we do on this earth does not mean that we have laws in verse 8 it is better to take refuge in the lord than to trust in man verse 9 it is better to take refuge in the lord than to trust in princes if you think you're trusting in men, even good men, there's nothing wrong with trusting somebody. But taking refuge in the Lord's bigger than that. 
and the princes, the owner rulers of this world. It's better to take refuge in the owner rulers rulers of this world than it is in the I'm sorry, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than the owner rulers of this world. And this applies what I'm going to read to you now applies not only to you, but it applies to present day Israel. Now, those that are attacking Israel, does God love them? Yes, he does. Are they wrong? Yes, they are. But does God love them? Yes, he does. You know, I've read already, and I'm not surprised. This gives me chill bumps. Some of the people that were on the side of attacking Israel, and I'm not trying to take sides here. I'm just saying that, but, but, but we do, you know, and nothing wrong with that even. There's right and there's wrong. But that's not what we're caught up in. You know what's been happening? People have been having dreams and seeing visions. And Jesus is coming to them. And some of these people that were involved in the attacks have trusted Christ. Now, does that sound like God? Sounds just like God, doesn't it? Same thing's happening all over the Middle East. The country that's turning to Christ the fastest per capita in the world is in Iran. Or if you say Iran, Iran, or whatever you want to say. But you see, God is not limited by space or borders. It's just amazing. In verse 10, it says, All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me, and yes, they, sur they surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. Now, I don't know what all this means. Say, they're going to get theirs. I think God is our protector, okay? Let me just leave it there. They surrounded me like, like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. In verse 17, I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. Now, you say, am I saying, look, they're going to get theirs. Those are bad people. God's going to get them. That is not what I'm saying. And that is not what the scripture is saying. I'm saying God is your protector. He is. And it says here, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And then verse 17, I will not die, but live. I will tell of the works of the Lord. As long as you're on this earth, no matter what's going on, whether things are going right for you or whether things are not going right for you, you're going to tell of the works of the Lord. What are the works of the Lord? Jesus said, you want to know the work of God? Here's what he said. Believe in him who sent me. That's what Jesus said. John 6, 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me. You believe in him. Place your faith in him. He says in verse 18, the Lord has disciplined me severely. That's David talking. But he has not given me over to death. And then verse 19, here we go. Open to me the gates of righteousness he has, okay? I shall enter them through them, and I shall give thanks to the Lord. Folks, this is what the Lord has done. Do you know you may know more even than David did? David is asking God to do something and probably not even understanding that he'd already done it. Verse 20, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. And then in verse 21, I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. Verse 22, now this is a big, big, big verse. This is a New Testament verse written in the Old Testament. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is what is responsible for holding up the building. The cornerstone in a building is the most important stone in the building. You might say it's the major load bearer. The stone which the builders rejected, that's Jesus. 
the Jews, even though he was a Jew. And I'm not putting the Jews down either. I'm just telling you, he was rejected by his own. He came to his own and his own received him not. John 1, 11. But that's also you. He became the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24. This is a big verse, big verse again. These are, this is where these verses came from. You may not even, you've heard these verses, but you may not even know where they were. Here's verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Some translations say, I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to jump down to verse 28 and 29. No, no I'm not. I'm just going to finish reading them. Oh, Lord, do save, we beseech you. Oh, Lord, we beseech you. That means ask. Do send prosperity. And he's not talking about money right here. Blessed is the one who came, comes in the name of the Lord. That's what John the Baptist said about Jesus. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. All of these are referring to Yahweh. All of these are referring to Jesus. The Lord, Yahweh, is God. You wonder where, you wonder where uh, we get that from? Jesus, fully God, fully man. This is before he was born. But he existed as Messiah, even before he existed physically as Jesus. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival, oh, look at this, sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You know what that means? <laughs> what happened on the altar? Sacrifice. What happened on the altar? There was a death. Jesus died. The festivals and the sacrifices died when Jesus did. It's not about the lights, the festival of lights. See, all of these things pointed to Jesus. It's not even about Yom Kippur, the day of the Lord. All of these things pointed to the one who was coming. They all pointed to the one who was going to live and die and be buried and be raised. But that has happened, not only in eternity, but in time. They died. Christ is our life. Then in verse 28 and 29, we're through with these. You are God, and I give thanks to you. Why do you give thanks to Jesus? Because he's God. You are, look at this, my God. Oh, boy, that, when I said that, you are my God. That sends chill bumps up and down my spine. Think about it. He's not a God. He's not even creator God. He is. But to me, you know who he is? He's my God. There's ownership there. Not only does he own me, but I possess him. It's just like when my oldest son was a little boy. Gosh, he was probably three, maybe two. And I was playing the guitar for the children at Bellevue Baptist Church. And believe me, there are a lot of them. You know, more people in the choir than most big churches have in their whole church. More deacons than most churches have members. And the little children, there are more little children in the nursery than the, probably the town you live in. But I was playing the guitar, doing scripture songs for these little kids, and they were into it. And Peter, my oldest, you've heard me say this, I'll say it again, he was standing on a table next to me. And he was singing along because he knew him. And then he would stop singing and he would point to me and he would say, my daddy, my daddy. He was taking ownership of me. Well, that's what God wants us to do with him. Take ownership. You are my God. I extol you. Then it says in this last verse, verse 29, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Well, if you'll notice, it starts with this verse in Psalm 118, 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And it finishes by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Well, 
there's some truths and some things I want to share with you before we stop. Pastors and people today get caught up in trying to fill up buildings or spreading a movement instead of just sharing life as they live it out. You get so caught up in trying to get people in, not understanding that they are in as far as God is concerned, but they don't know it. We share the life that he has been that we have been given. A life lived out is a life given away. If you're not going through life understanding that he wants you to give this life that is yours away, then then you're missing it. A life given away, listen, is a life that will change the world. The movement's not going to change the world. They come and they go. And getting bigger and bigger churches is not going to change the world. We're seeing that because they're not getting bigger and bigger as a rule. But things that we give away, others also give away. I put three stars by this for me. I want to share something that that God showed me. It was important to me. And maybe it'll be important to you. Your expectations, no matter how grand many times can be a limit as to what the Holy Spirit would do through you. Your expectations, no matter how grand, may actually be a limit to what the Holy Spirit would do through you. Sometimes the big things that we think we're called to do are minuscule. And maybe just pouring your life into one person as you love him. Not even with the desire to teach him anything or her anything. It could be a mother just spending time with her own children. A grandmother just loving on her grandchildren. A sister going and holding somebody's hand when they're going through a hard time. You don't have any answers. It's okay. You don't have to. Just hold the hand. Well, I want to say that sometimes my plans are in direct opposition of the blessings God has intended for me. I'm talking to myself. I've been going through this for the last few years. Sometimes my plans are in direct opposition of the blessings God has intended for me. I'm not saying don't have a plan. I'm not saying that. But let your plan be to let the Holy Spirit live out his life through you. And here's what this results in. And I put a bunch of stars and underlined it in red. This is for me. These are my notes to me. See, I'm not trying to give you a sermon. I'm not even trying to get up a sermon. I just write things down for me that apply to me. And here's one of them. When we understand that God's blessings may not be what we had in mind at all, It will result in things happening that are so big they can't be measured. You know, when I was pastoring churches, and Linda, you were there in uh, Maumelle, and we saw the town Maumelle, Arkansas, which is across the river from Little Rock. It's a really nice town. And we saw this little church grow so fast. One year it was a, a, a church plant, literally, handful of people. And within three years, we had 500 folks. One year, we had no baptisms. The next year, we were number 12 in the state in Arkansas. And I look back on that and think, that was really amazing. And it was. But, folks, we were working our plan, and we had this doing, we were doing this, and we were doing all these things. Folks, I don't care how big whatever you're doing looks. If it can be counted or measured, it's not real big. If it can be counted, measured, or kept up with, it's not real big. Here's some things that I didn't understand, me, and many of my pastor friends did not understand. They did not understand what eternity was. Eternity doesn't begin when we get to heaven. You understand? Eternity doesn't begin. Eternity has no beginning. 
Everything that will be already is and was, okay? The same yesterday and today and forever. I thought, and most of my pastor buddies think, that I was chosen to work for Christ. I wasn't chosen to work for Christ. I was chosen to be loved by God. Colossians 3.12. Ephesians 1.4. Throughout the whole New Testament. I now want to just believe God for whatever he wants to do through me. You don't have to know. You don't even have to have a clue. It's all right. And then three truths that I think will bless you. You say, who wrote them? I did. <laughs> I still think they're true. Here you go. As you look up with a grateful heart, you get glimpses of glory through the windows that God has prepared for you. As you look up with a grateful heart, you get glimpses of glory through the windows that God has prepared. You can't live in heaven yet, physically, but you can experience a foretaste of your ultimate hope. Thankfulness opens up these experiences. This provides further reasons to be grateful Thus, your path becomes an upward spiral. The more you're thankful for, the more you see Christ. Sue, I can think of you, cancer three times. You know, one day you probably will die unless the Lord returns. One day you will. It's amazing. It hadn't yet. Started a long time ago. The first cancer you had is what caused you to trust Christ. Am I right? Absolutely. The second can Was it the second cancer that a little boy prayed for you or the third one? It was the second cancer that a little boy named Yahshua was, was prayed for. He said he was six years old. I don't remember the exact date, but he was a little boy. He prayed for her. She said she felt it in her body. They told her her cancer had metastasized and basically didn't give her a lot of good, good news. And then when they went in and did the surgery, it hadn't metastasized. And it was the easiest one you had. I saw it with my eyes. Yeah, she said she saw it with her eyes. She had a thankful spirit, and then the third time, and yet thankful. And, you know, we get so caught up in sickness and in illness. I mean, let's face it. In this body, our bodies aren't getting better. They're getting older. From the day you're born. I don't want that. That's why I pray for you. I pray for you. I think that as believers... Now, do I understand all this? I don't. But I'm telling you that God has empowered us to pray for the sick, to heal the sick. The Bible says to raise the dead. Now, that seems crazy. I'm not saying that hadn't happened. I'm just saying that. But he's also, you know, when we, something that's involved with raising the dead is when people think they're dead spiritually. And as far as they're concerned, they are. When they come to know who they are in Christ, They've been raised. And the Bible says to walk in newness of life. Well, it does not entail a denial of reality. That's what some people think. You just have to deny it. Deny it. I don't receive that. Well, there's a word for that. It's called stupid. Now, that's not your identity. Sickness is not your identity. Illness is not your identity. Despair is not your identity. Do people have mental issues? I mean, mental, they need mental wellness as well as physical wellness. Of course they do. And this is not a put down on anybody at all. But when we, when we live in denial of reality, that's not what this is talking about. It does not entail a denial of reality. Instead, it rejoices in Christ our Savior, in the midst of our trials and tribulations. It doesn't mean that the trials and the tribulations go away. Because for most of the people in the Old Testament, those trials, in, or New Testament, excuse me, Paul's day, and the early Christians, most of their trials did not go away. Many of them died martyrs. And yet, they rejoiced. So much of this 
We don't have any understanding about what this is. We, we don't know. But truth's truth. So I want to say, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're going to reveal to us our present reality of being in Christ and that you love everyone that we lay our eyes on and those that we don't lay our eyes on. You love them just as you love us. And we will have a thankful heart in spite of things going around us, going on around us. And as a result, we'll begin to see things as you say they are. And things will appear different to us that we've never seen before. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.